house to come and worship and celebrate together. And I'm glad to be in the house of the Lord, aren't you? Let's praise God for being in the house of the Lord. For somebody is sick. Somebody's in the hospital. Somebody's in prison and they're not able to go out and do like we are doing. They're not able to come out and worship. But God has blessed us again. Amen. Somebody say again. again. And we are clothed in our right mind. We have health and strength. And we are able to come out and worship the Lord. So God bless you. Thank you for joining us again this morning. Those of you that are here in the sanctuary, we thank you for being here. And those of you that are watching us virtually, we say God bless you. And again, thank you for tuning in with us this morning. God is good. He is faithful. Amen. Amen. And I tell you what, there's so much going on in the world. If you don't, if you're not, they had that little song that said, there's a storm out on the ocean and it's moving this way. If your soul is not anchored in Jesus, you might slowly drift away. And I tell you what, it's a whole lot going on in our world today. And if we're not anchored in the Lord, if we're not anchored in the word of God, if we're not solidified and have an assurance of who we are in Christ, I said, who we are in Christ. I'm not talking about who we are just in the flesh. But who we are in Christ. The Bible says we are most men, most miserable. If only in this life only we have hope. But thank God our hope is in, in something higher than what we have here. Amen. Our hope is in something better than what we experience here. That one song said, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. And his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, the best building, the best architects and all of that. I don't trust all of that. But I'm wholly leaning on Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And he says, on Christ, the solid rock I stand. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. And that's where we got to be, folks. In this time that we're living in, we've got to be on, have our hope in Christ. Because that's the solid rock, can you? That's the solid rock. Solid rock. Amen. That's the solid rock. And there's another little hymn I want you to help me sing this morning. It's called At the Cross. Since we're in Lent, Lent season, we're still in Lent season. And uh, I want somebody to help me sing because it was at the cross. Somebody say, At the Cross. It wasn't through the bank account, it wasn't through my uh, rich neighbors and family, but it was at the cross where I first saw the light. God bless you guys, and we want you to help me sing a little bit of that. Because it was at the cross where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. Y'all help me join in, let's sing it together. At last I did my Savior believe, and did my sovereign.
Another day that you've given us to get it right. Another day that you've given us to trust in you. Another day that you've given us to stretch out in faith and believe. We thank you, Father, for this day that you've given us. One that we've never seen before. We are grateful for health and strength. But even more so, we are grateful for salvation. Because one day, Father, you came and you gave yourself for our sins. You hung on that cross and you accepted all kind of brutality and cruelness just for us. And here we come to say thank you. Thank you. We come to reverence you as our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords. Knowing that there is none like you in all the earth. And Father, today all of our hope and our trust is in you, the Almighty God. We, our trust is not in stocks and bonds. Our trust is not in man. Our trust is not in the president or whoever, Republican or Democrat. Our president, our trust is are not in those kind of things. But all of our trust is in you. And Father, you are our king. You are our way maker. You are our help. You are our shelter. You are everything. And we thank you for it today. And we pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would continue to look on us. Continue to look on the faithful. Look on those Christians that are constantly struggling. They may be in harm's way overseas trying to spread the gospel. Remember them. Those that are over there in, in the war zones, Hamas and Israel and all over that, that region. Father, remember those precious souls. And I ask you to remember those down there in Haiti. War turning and, and violence wreaking the country. Lord, remember them. And give us a heart of compassion. Yeah. Give our president a heart of compassion yeah. to remember and extend a helping hand. In the name of yeah. Jesus, you said it's our job to look out for the widows, look out for the little, the, the one that can't look out for themselves. We ask you to intervene in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would look on us, even among us, 
There are those that have experienced grief and heartache. There are those that have experienced pain as a result of losing a loved one. And again, Lord, as we do every week, we pray for those. We pray for my friend, Brother Fred and Miss Jeannie Thaw. He's got a, he's been walking that road, Lord, humbly. And he has submitted to the, that assignment. I ask you to have mercy on him. Have mercy on Miss Jeannie. Let him hear your voice. Let him be saved in the name of Jesus. I pray for my friend, Brother Scott Daugherty and Miss Marisol, his wife. And I ask you to have mercy upon them. He too have been holding that line. He's been towing the line, Father. Ministering to his wife and being there for her. And I pray that you would be merciful unto them. Have mercy, Father. Have mercy. Somebody say, have mercy, Lord. Have mercy, Lord. And Father, we pray that you would continue to look on our friends there in Alabama. Continue to heal their hurts and their wounds after the result of a loss. Remember our friends and cousins there in Savannah, Georgia, who've experienced great loss. I ask you to heal their hearts. Comfort them in those times when they're hurting, when they're sad. Lift them up in the name of Jesus. And I pray for even our family, the common family that have experienced a loss. We pray that you would continue to look on that family, heal their hurts, Comfort them in those times when they're bereaved and hurting. Even their his precious wife, I pray that you would comfort her, strengthen her in the name of Jesus, and cause that family to look up to you, Lord, because you are our only help. We pray for the low family, Father, in the name of Jesus. That great saintly mother, Lord, is in the hospital now, I believe, still. And we know that you hold her in the palm of your hand. But not just for her, but for the family, Lord, and those relatives and family members. We pray that you would comfort them, that you would heal their hurts. And God calls them to reach up to you and trust in you, knowing that you are the God that gives life and you can take it away. But it's okay if you call us when our heart is right with you. It's okay when you call us when it's well with our soul. So, Father, look on that family. I pray for healing. I pray for comfort. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will help them one by one, name by name, that you will speak to their hearts and let them know everything is going to be all right. I pray for my friend, Brother Moses Wilcox, there in Georgia. pray that you will continue to help him to hold on to your hand. Let him keep the faith. We pray, Father, for our Navy friend there in Alabama, Brother Cleveland Ewing and his precious wife and those there in Alabama. We pray that you would continue to strengthen them. Let them know that you are with them. Even though the enemy is all around us and sometimes things look like they're going to fall apart, we know that you hold us in the palm of your hand and we can rely and trust on you, the almighty God. We trust in you, Father. And even among us here, there may be situations and circumstances that only you can work out. We pray that you save and deliver and set free. Save sons and daughters. Save nieces and nephews. Save those, God, that maybe have wandered away and look like they have no way of returning. Save them, God. Cause them to hear the word of God. Cause them to run into somebody that will share the good news of Jesus Christ. And as a result, let their hearts be changed before it's everlasting too late. And then, Father, right here among us, we pray that you will continue to look on us as we spread the word of God. Continue to look on us as we share the good news of Jesus Christ. Have your way in this place. Have your way in our hearts. Let your word fall on tender soil, tender hearts. And as a result, God, let it bring forth much fruit in our lives. In the name of Jesus. So now we bind the hand of the enemy that will come to distract us. We bind the hand of the enemy that brings confusion and chaos. And we speak now that the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds now as we're getting ready to hear and receive the almighty, all-powerful seed of the word of God. We pray for these that are here. Let your word fall on good hearts and tender soil. And as a result, bring forth good fruit. We pray now, Father, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will continue to be acceptable in your sight. For again, you are my strength, and you are my redeemer. And we ask this in the precious name of Jesus. And can we say amen, amen, and amen, and amen. amen. amen.
All right. God bless you this morning. Again, we thank you for joining us this morning. And to our friends watching virtually, we ask you to uh, call your friends. You know the routine. Call your besties and let them know that your favorite pastor is back. Amen. And he's got a word just for you to encourage you, to inspire you, to expect greater in your life. Amen. Amen. So I want to call your attention to our scripture reading for today. And I'm going to St. Matthew's chapter 16. This is a very familiar uh, passage for most Christians, I think. It's in Matthew chapter 16. And I'm going to read a few verses here. I'm starting at the part of the 21st verse. My subject today is the Christ revealed. And I ask a question, how prepared are you? The Christ revealed. How prepared are you? Do everybody have a Bible? How young y'all have a Bible back there, guys? Good. All right. All right, good. I only got the word right there. So we at St. Matthew 16. And I'm going to start reading at the 21st verse. Anybody that don't have a Bible, we got some here and you can, we can share. All right, starting at the 21st verse. Y'all ready? Please read silently as I read aloud. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer. Somebody say suffer. suffer. Many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes. Listen, that sounds like the church people, doesn't it? And be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be unto you. 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Wow. Thou art an offense unto me. For you savest not, or you embraces not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. We're going to stop there. May God bless the reading of his word. And I want us to do our Bible confession now as we get ready to go into this word of God. Let's do our Bible confession together. Let's say it in unison. Y'all ready? Let's read it aloud. Awake, awake, and arise, O my soul. I am about to receive the all-powerful, ever-living, life-changing seed of the word of Almighty God. I boldly confess my mind is alert and my heart is receptive to receive. And by faith, pursue God's will for my life. His word renews and transforms my mind. His word illuminates my path and causes me to see through the lens of God my Father. And by faith, I am everything he says I am. And I can do everything he says I can do. And by faith, I am saved. I am an overcomer and victorious in this life and throughout eternity. I will never be the same. I will never be the same in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Y'all saying that like you mean it. And listen, that's the power of the word. That's the power of the word. Y'all may be seated. His word changes my life. His word changes my mind. Because you know, sometimes, have you ever, you know, we are, we are educated people. You know what? And I love education. I don't knock it. I've got education too. But listen, sometimes, somebody say sometimes, sometimes, our education can get in the way and cloud our judgment of what God is saying to us. Y'all know that? You know, the Bible said there's a way that seems right to people, but the end of that way are the way of death. All right, sometimes I know what I'm doing. I know what I think. I know what I'm feeling. And those feelings could be legitimate, Right? But how many know when we back off and say, all right, Lord, I need to know that 
I'm doing this according to your will. I want to know if I'm walking in the path that you have ordained for me. Okay. How many know sometimes God's perspective is a whole lot different from our out of what? Y'all remember? From our perception. Because that five senses, man, can get us in trouble if we are not carefully walking humbly with God. Because even our flesh going to tell us how to do stuff. And we're going to find out in our lesson here. Sometimes we think we are Christian and walking with God, but listen, we may not be as prepared to walk with him as we think. Because the apostle Paul told us, I have to do a couple of things. I got to learn. I got to grow in grace. I got to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. Amen? Amen. We got to grow into this thing. Listen, the babies born in the womb, when they are born, watch this, y'all. Babies aren't born walking and running and jumping. None of us were born that way, right? Well, guess what? As somebody trained and taught us, we learn, and we begin to do all of the things that we are able to do now, aren't we? We can run, we can jump, we can read, we can sing, we can clap. But we weren't born doing that. That's why Paul he, uh, encourages each one of us to grow in the grace of God. Grow in the word of God so that we'll be strong in the Lord and we don't end up like the, like Peter was in our text today. So, again, God bless you. We're glad you're here. Thank you for watching and joining us virtually. God's got a word to encourage us again. And I, how many of you love to be encouraged? I, I need to be encouraged because there's too much going on, man. There's so much going on, it can confuse you. It can cloud your judgment, cloud your mind. And before you know it, you can be in a certain place where you really didn't desire to be. But God sends his word, the Bible said, to heal us and to deliver us from all destruction. That's why he sends his word. That's why he sends his word. His word takes away anxiety, folks. His word lifts us, lifts people up out of depression. If you've seen the numbers of people that we run into as counselors, on a weekly basis and how they are struggling and their issues. Listen, you'll be like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I look over my life sometime and I just kind of look back and see how God had navigated my life. I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about myself, right? Amen. How God had navigated my life as I drew closer to him, as I prayed and asked him to lead me. And folks, not bragging, but thank God I'm in a good place now. Can anybody say you're in a good place? Amen. I'm in a peaceful place. Amen. I'm in a restful place. Yeah. And I don't, I had a little anxiety yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, James, I don't normally have anxiety. All right, All I was right. trying to do some things, get some things accomplished. And look like the, the whole two days went by and I hadn't accomplished what I was trying to accomplish. And I, yep, I had a little anxiety. But you know what I did? I do what I always do. I go back in my little closet, Mother Bright. I'm like, all right, Lord. Jesus said, his peace he gives to me. He said, his peace he leaves with me. Amen. And then he told me, don't let my heart be troubled. Don't be over anxious. And don't be afraid. Amen. And you know what I do after I quote that? I cover myself. I say, all right, my peace. I receive my peace back. I refuse to walk around over anxious. I refuse to let anything and anybody ride on me and get me all off my... I refuse. I say, so I receive my peace now. Amen. I receive my peace. Y'all ever do that? Yeah. I dare you to try it. In the name of Jesus, I dare you to try it. When you are being rattled and you are feeling all anxious and you are worried and all, all over the place, grip yourself. Close your eyes and just say, Jesus, your word says, your peace you've given to us and your peace you leave with us. So if I let it go, whose fault is that? It's my fault, right? If I let it go, God bless you, Miss Diane. If I let it go and I get myself all in a frenzy and a tizzy, listen, it's my fault because Jesus done told me I've given you the peace. The peace of God that passes all understanding. He said, I'll guard your heart. Hallelujah. Anybody need him to guard your heart today? Amen. Oh, yeah, I need him to guard my heart today. So, listen, God bless you again. And as we kind of go through this a little bit, I'm just going to give you, this part is just going to be a preview, an introduction, because I, I won't get through all of it. But 
I want to encourage you. The topic of the lesson is the Christ revealed. Somebody said the Christ, the Christ. Revealed. revealed. And I'm going to ask you a question. How prepared are you? How prepared are you? As we approach the time of the year when Christ would be crucified and resurrected, there would be a great divide. Somebody say a great divide. Not only did the carnal mind struggle with the strange news, but the Christian community would also experience an uproar. Because sometimes, somebody say sometimes. Sometimes. The Bible says it this way. Let us take heed to the things that we hear, lest at any time we let them slip by. Then he said, there is a way that seems right to us, to a man, but the end of that way leads to death. Amen? Amen. So as we look at this scripture today, I want us to keep that in mind. The Christ revealed, and the question is, how prepared are you? Yeah, yeah. (coughs) Some scholars see Matthew's gospel as presenting Jesus as the new Moses who presents a new law to combat lawlessness in the church. Yet others believe the book was written to as providing instruction in Christian beliefs and the lifestyle for new converts. And yet others see this book as Matthew providing a theological foundation for the mission to the Gentile community. But more than that, all of these are may be correct to some degree. But more than that, the book of Matthew is a story about Jesus the Christ. Somebody say it's about Jesus. Jesus. Not only does this book depict Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, where he would suffer, die, and be raised again, but also provides an explanation of the necessity of this journey. Not only does it talk about the journey, but it gives us why it's necessary for him to go this way. You know that one passage Jesus said, and he was with the disciples, he said, I must needs to go through Samaria. Y'all remember that? And he went through the Samarian territory, even though, watch this now, even though the Jews and the Samaritans did not get along, even though Jesus knew that he was going in danger territory, he said, I must go through there. Why? The word of God needed to be shared with somebody there. And y'all remember what happened when he went there and he sat there by that well? And that woman showed up, that Samaritan woman, and she started questioning him. You know, we don't have no dealings with y'all. That's just like people saying today. You know, blacks don't get along with the whites. Oh, the Hispanics don't get along with these people. We don't need to be bare now. We don't need to invite them to church because we don't, you know, we don't think the same way. The devil is a lie. That's the same way they were thinking in the scripture. Oh, Samaritans still on one side and the Jews still over there. And we don't have no dealings with each other. How many of you know that that's not what Jesus intended? Amen. That's not what he intended. He intended us to grow together in the word and in wisdom and be able to at least get along with one another. Amen? Amen. Amen. You don't have to see everything, that understand everything the way I understand it, but we ought to be able to come to some common ground and get along. Y'all hear me? You know, when I look at the news, sometimes it's depressing. Because you got people up there in the Congress, they're supposed to be Christians too. And they don't, they're fighting each other. What kind of junk is that? That tells you that something is not right there. Amen? Amen. All right, so I'm moving on. Somebody said, move on, Pastor. Yeah, so those scholars, even back in Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they all had their view of what the church should look like. They all had their view of what should be going on and how the law should be written and how it should be ran, right? But Jesus came with a different message. And they fought him for having a different kind of message. Amen? Amen. So watch this. The nature of Jesus calling as the Messiah and the book draws out the implication of the passion Christ has, not only for disciples, but for people in general. His passion drew strong and immediate rejection from Peter. We just read that passage, right? 
when Jesus told them how he was going to have to go through Jerusalem, how he was going to be beaten and hung on the cross and crucified. Peter, and we said Peter because Peter spoke out, but guess what, folks? A whole lot of the other folk that was with him probably felt the same way. They just didn't have the nerve to be vocal about it. How many of you, when you hear something, and you be like, man, I hope somebody will say something, but that's not right. They need to say something about that. You may not say it, but you're hoping somebody will speak out, don't you? Yeah. And that's the same way I believe it was here in this text. And Peter, when Jesus told him all of that, what was going to happen to him, Peter pulled Jesus to the side and started rebuking Jesus. He started rebuking Jesus. Why would he do that? You think he was doing that because, oh yeah, I, I don't, I hate him. I don't like Jesus. No, no, no. He wasn't rebuking him for that reason. He didn't have an understanding. And he wasn't prepared yet to walk the walk that Jesus was talking about. How many of you know, as newborn babes, the scripture said, newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. He didn't say you desire the big steaks and the hard meat, right? He said as newborn babes, we desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow. Therefore, Peter even as verbal as he was and as courageous as he was, Peter was not prepared for what Jesus was talking about. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Listen, a lot of us, most Christians, we can follow Jesus. Y'all follow me now. Most Christians can follow Jesus as long as Jesus is talking about a blessing plan. Oh, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to take care of you, and I'm going to heal you. Oh, we follow Jesus closely by then. Okay. That's how the disciples were, and many of those people that followed him, they followed closely because they were looking and expecting a healing. They was expecting for him to work a miracle for them. They weren't, they weren't expecting for him to come talk about some sad story about, I'm going to go to the cross. You know, I know I'm happy now, but they're going to beat me up. They're going to spit on me. And they're going to just try to kill me. They're going to kill me. Actually, they're going to hang me on a rugged cross. And I'm going to die on the cross. Most of us, even Christians, aren't prepared for that message. Not prepared for that message. But if you talk about, oh yeah, I'm going to bless you with a new house. Or, oh yeah, I'm going to bless you with a new car. Oh yeah, I'm going to heal you. Oh, oh, oh yeah, we run to that, don't we? Y'all better hear me now. The same way it was then is the same way it is now in most situations. You call and tell somebody, oh, well, we got this big prophet coming in, and he's going to prophesy, and he's going to tell you your future. Uh -oh. And oh, man, you get a packed house, because everybody want to hear about what their future looks like. I want to know. I want to know. I want to know. But you call a prayer meeting. It'll be just as quiet as it is in now. <laughs> well, pray, man. I'm, I'm just going to pray at home. I don't want to congregate at the church. I'm going to pray at home. That's not us now, y'all. We, we come out and we pray together. But a lot of times, people will they'll go to a concert and they'll crowd it out. They'll go to a ball game and they'll fool up the stadium. Y'all can say amen. You know I'm right. And unless there's somebody prophetic going to come and tell them about how God's going to bless them, Mother Bright, what God's going to do in their life, a lot of times, sometimes even Christians, if we're not quite prepared yet, I'm not going to that. I don't want to hear much about that. But if you talk about a blessing plan, talk about how God's going to give you a husband or a wife, or how God's going to do, do something in your life that you need it done, we run to that, don't we? But here in this text, Jesus did not talk about healing. He did not discuss putting spittle on his on the man's eye and blood and healing. He didn't talk about that. He didn't even talk about going to Jairus' house and healing the dog. He didn't talk about none of that. He began to dialogue and tell them what's going to happen days ahead. 
And you know, in the Lent season, you know, that's the, the 40 days leading up to it, right? We are still in the Lent season. In this season, people, they were expecting a Messiah, but they weren't expecting somebody like Jesus to come. And certainly, when they were, when they were expecting him, the Messiah to come, he didn't look like what they, what they thought he would look like. And now that he had come, and he was getting ready to go to the cross and fulfill the mandate that God had sent him to do, the ultimate mandate, people didn't, they, they, they weren't violent. And Peter, he, let's look at Peter, maybe Peter is the senior deacon of the church. The senior deacon. Or maybe he's the head missionary of the, of the lead pastor. And here it is, the word of God, Jesus began to tell them what he's going to have to suffer and what he's going to endure. He said, and suffer. I must go to Jerusalem and suffer. Anybody like to suffer? <laughs> Anybody like to struggle? We don't like to struggle, do we? Nobody likes to suffer. None of us want to struggle. We want to have an easy life. <laughs> she said, yes. We want to have an easy life. But how many of you know the road to victory, especially in this kingdom way, in one way or another, going to lead to some kind of suffering? I said the road to victory in this kingdom journey that you and I are walking on, in some fashion or form, going to lead and deal with some kind of suffering. <laughs> Oh, y'all stay with me there on virtual. Stay with me here. I'm going somewhere with this. But listen, when you talk about, you know, I go to the gym now. I'm trying to get back on track, trying to keep my body in shape and stuff. And we say we're going to try to, my wife and I, we're going to try to go at least three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And how many of you know sometimes that don't happen? Sometimes that don't happen. But listen, we go there, and Brother Chase, we go in there and I go into a little section where to lift some, some weights and I may start lifting some weights or whatever. May do some little curls with my legs and all that kind of stuff. But listen, if I would leave and not accept the pain that go along with that, okay. you think my legs will get stronger? No. I won't get any stronger. I'll just be saying weak legs like I always had, man. Think my arms are getting any stronger? As soon as I lift up, oh, they're too high. Oh, that hurts. And I go home and, oh, yeah, it hurts my arm. Well, well I'm not going back. You think my arms going to get any stronger? The same way it is in the spiritual journey. When we start walking with the Lord, sure, God loves us. He promised that he's going to be with us all the way. But listen, a part of the uh, success in this journey is going to have to deal with some struggle. Even if it's a struggle with addiction that you have. Even if it's a struggle where I'm struggling with some kind of uh, sickness that I have. Listen, sometimes you're going to struggle with that before you get the victory. Now why do I need to struggle with it if Jesus can just touch me and I'll be healed? Sometimes, I said sometimes. Just like that man came to Jesus and he said, Good master, what must I do to be saved? And the Lord started telling him, you know what the commandments are. And he said, you know what he said? Good master, I kept all of them. I know about all of them. I've been doing that since I was a kid. And then Jesus got to have the caveat. You know what Jesus told him? He said, okay, good. Now go and sell that you have and give to the poor. Then you come and follow me. <laughs> now why did Jesus tell him that? He don't tell everybody to sell all of their goods and give to the poor. He told us we need to look out for the poor, right? But he did not tell every single person that he healed, he did not tell them to go sell all your goods and give to the poor. So why did Jesus tell this man that? The Bible said because this man was hung up on his riches. He had plenty of wealth and he was not sharing it with anybody. Remember that story? He said, cause he said, oh, my bonds, my crops brought forth plenty, and I got a whole lot going on now. So what I'm going to do, he didn't say I'm going to go out and take care of some needy people. I'm going to go and help some of the widows. I'm going to go and help some of those poor people in poverty-stricken areas, the marginalized and all that. He didn't say that. You know what he said? I'm going to tear down these old barns, and I'm going to build bigger barns, and then I'm going to put all my goods in there. 
all my wealth, all my money, all my stock, all my bonds, I'm going to lay it up for myself. And then the Lord spoke. He said, thy fool. That's what the scripture says. Thy fool. He said, this night your soul is required of me. Then he asked the question, so now where were all of these goods that you're going to store up for yourself, what's going to become of them? And the Lord went on to make that statement. He says, blessed is the person that is rich toward God. That's where the richness comes in, isn't it? That's where the blessing comes in. Because listen, I know people that got money, but their mind is not right. I know people have gotten, worked hard and did a lot and did some good things, but they're sick and they've got some kind of struggle going on within them. Anybody know any people like that? Sometimes people do all they can to get what they think they need only to come up empty and, and, and say, wow. Ask that same question that Jesus asked. What does it profit a man or woman to gain all of this but yet die and lose our soul. Yeah. Y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay, so watch this now. So then Peter, like many Christians today, was unprepared to accept the notion that the Messiah's glory would be achieved only through suffering. Peter was unprepared to hear that. He thought Jesus was going to tell him some of this other great stuff. Oh, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to rule and I'm going to be the king and all of that. And Jesus talked about, I'm going to have to go to the cross. I'm going to have to suffer. Peter said, no, -uh. I know. I won't let that happen to you, Jesus. Peter remembered when Jesus healed the blind person. He remembered when Jesus raised the people from the dead. He remembered Jesus showing all of this power. And now you're talking about you will let them take you to the cross and beat you and kill you? Peter said, not over my dead body, it won't. <laughs> and I'm paraphrasing. He said, I'm not going to let that happen. Now watch this. The question is, how prepared are you? This is the same Peter prior to this scenario that Jesus asked them and the disciples. He said, who do men say that I am, guys? I want to know what people are saying about me. He said, who do the people say that I am? And I'm going to go, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're the prophet. Some say you this and you that. And then Jesus got more specific. He said, well, since you've been following me all this time, or you've been in church all this time, you're supposed to be hearing the word. He said, so who do you say that I am? That's what got real thick. They've been coming to church with Jesus, hearing his messages, and they were saying, amen, pastor. Preach Jesus. Oh, yeah, Jesus. <laughs> and so now Jesus says, so who do you all say? Talk to the disciples now. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, the verbal group, verbal one in the group, he stood up and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. That made Jesus feel good. At least one of them know who I am. And Jesus applauded him, didn't he? He said, man, blessed are you, man. Flesh and blood didn't reveal that. My father in heaven had to reveal that because people don't know that yet. And here it is now in this sentence, maybe a day or so later, they have this encounter when Jesus began to take his message further and share with them what's going to happen as he walked this journey. And all of a sudden now, he didn't applaud Peter about that. You know what he said to Peter? You remember what he said? <laughs> when Peter took him, 27th verse, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from you, Lord, this shall not be done unto you. 23rd verse, but he turned, Jesus turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> now he just applauded him. For telling him what the great man and how he knew that God must have had to reveal that to him. And now he's not applauding Peter this time. Why? Because Peter was not yet prepared. He had not grown to understand what this real Christian walk was all about. So Peter was like, 
This will never happen to you. I will not allow it. And Jesus rebuked him right in the midst of them. He said, get behind me, Satan, because you are an offense to me. What does that mean? When we become an offense to the Lord or the gospel message, folks, that means we are standing in the way of what God is trying to reveal to us. Standing in the way. Somebody say standing in the way. When we are an offense, that also means I'm not in agreement and I'm not accepting the message that God is trying to tell me. Because sometimes, so I say sometimes, the message that God is trying to tell us, number one, it's not what I want to hear. Anybody ever had God speaking to you? Down in your spirit? And you know, I don't want to even accept that, Lord. I don't want to do that. For whatever reason, I don't want to do that. It could be something about forgiving your spouse. Or it could be telling you, oh, oh, go and encourage your neighbor across the house. Well, encourage them in the Lord. I'm not doing that because I know they don't like me. I don't like them. We don't get along. <laughs> Anybody ever wrestle with that kind of stuff beside me? Listen, God is going to, this is some of the suffering that he's talking about. He don't mean you're going to have to go and be nailed to the cross, all of us. But some of us, somebody said, something for some of us, and I said, maybe the fact that I'm going to have to get, get rid of bitterness. That could be something that i got to get over. Like this rich man, he had to get over his pride and all of his wealth and money and settle down to obey the Lord. Some of us may have to get rid of some kind of addiction that's been riding on us for years. That could be a form of suffering, Amen. Some of us may have children that have gone astray and they don't seem like they don't want to turn back to the Lord. That could be a part of our suffering. And God wants us to walk it out until we can see the salvation of the Lord. Do you think God can bring salvation, folks? Do you think God knows how to turn things around? Y'all better hear me today. God knows how to turn it around. But if he turn it around too soon, if he changed me too soon, Mother Bright, if he healed and delivered me too soon, guess what most of us will do? Oh, my problem wasn't that bad. I really didn't need the Lord to do that. I, I, I could have did it myself. It wasn't that bad because, see, I'm doing better now. I'm doing a whole lot better now. Some people have a bout of depression, and they've been depressing. One week, they may go for a, through depression week after week. They may feel good for a few days and have some kind of manic episode. Then all of a sudden, they're back in depression. That could be a type of suffering. And when they trust God and walk with God and hear the word, and after a while they, be, they begin to see that depression lifted, that's a victory testimony, isn't it? Yeah. But now, if they had depression, and depression, you know, I had it for a day, then all of a sudden, now, you know, I, I prayed and asked God to help me, and all of a sudden the, the depression lifted me so fast, now I probably walk away thinking, you know what, maybe I wasn't that depression either. I didn't really need God to do that. See, I'm better now. So sometimes, somebody say sometimes, I believe one of the reasons why God don't expediently deliver because not only he want to give us good success outwardly, I believe God want to change us inwardly. Somebody say inwardly. And most of us, even me, don't like to have to go through stuff that's going to challenge me. We don't like to have to go through stuff that's going to make me have to work and labor. We don't want that. Hey, let, just let it happen right here. Let's do it right now, Lord. Make it happen and let it go away. And but with most of the stuff that's going to happen in our life, we're going to struggle in some area before we get the real victory. So, why don't we do this? Why don't us do what the Word says then? Why don't we do what? Arm ourselves, likewise, so that whenever it comes, or whatever it looks like, we'll be able to handle it and go through and represent God in a good way. Y'all yeah. hear me? Does it make any sense to anybody? Yeah. Give us some feedback there, virtual church, so let me know whether, whether you're receiving this or not. Because listen, if it happens too soon, I'll walk away thinking, oh, I did it all by myself. Y'all remember with, with Gideon's story in the Old Testament, when God told Gideon, I'm going to save the, your people just... I'm going to use you to save you and deliver your people. And Gideon went through a scenario with him and back and forth. Lord, show me. I need to make sure. He put his little fleeces out there. And Gideon had some 
30 something thousand men that he was done got together that he was going to go to a war with these other groups, right? And the Lord said, you got too many. The Lord said, I'm going to, help, I'm going to show you how to cut back. And when, the, when God finished cutting him back, he only had 300 soldiers. And his other side, his opposition had thousands. And God said, I'm going to deliver you with these 300. Why did God say that? He told him to cut back. Because God said, if you deliver, if I delivered you with all these thousands, you would swear that your people, God, bought you this victory. You would never equate it to God and his power. That's the same way with us. If God deliver us so fast, listen, we would think, I did it by myself. I didn't really need God to do that. I did it by myself. But God's going to do it in such a way that he alone gets the credit for what he's doing. Amen? So he wanted to show Peter that, listen, he said, Peter, get behind me because your view your perspective, or your process, your your uh, what's my word? Your perception is not in alignment with my perspective. And sometimes, so I say sometimes, as we are new walking with the Lord, and even sometimes as, after we've been walking with the Lord, He's still growing us up, He's still maturing us. But sometimes we still don't have God's perspective about the Christian journey that we are on. That's why I ask you, are you prepared? Because listen, we're in the season of open doors. I told y'all, right? Prophetically, yeah. we're in the season of open doors. But guess what, folks? Open doors are good, right? Yeah. Normally, when you hear that phrase, open doors, okay, yeah. Right. But with open doors also comes some challenges. No, oh, y'all don't believe it. Oh, no. Open doors means I'm going to have a list going to be really good for me. Well, it's only good if you are prepared. Don't move so fast. It's only as good as you are prepared. Because I've seen God open up doors and bless people to get in a good place. And they weren't prepared. And guess what happened? The stuff start falling apart. Amen. Stuff start falling apart. Give somebody the man of their, the, the person of their dream, the, the man of their, their life, and the woman of their dreams. And all of a sudden, I wasn't prepared for that, and I didn't want me to go to church every service, and I don't want to go. Now, the same thing that was a blessing ended up being a struggle. Why? Because I wasn't prepared. Oh, y'all better hear me. Woo! I'm moving on. So I said, move on, Pastor. So Brother Peter was not prepared for this. He was not prepared for that heavy kind of word today. He was not ready for it. And he told Jesus, this will never happen. Listen, can you imagine? <laughs> you, your, your boss has been doing this job for years and years and knows all the ins and outs about it. And you've just been on there two, two, six months or something. And then the boss been giving you some good news about how the stocks were doing and how all of them it was making good money and all of that. And then all of a sudden the boss come in one day and said, but, but however, guys, you know, we're going to have to make some changes and have to make some drastic cutbacks. And I need to start with you and you and you. <laughs> Can you imagine what you'd be thinking? Maybe now, boss, can't we do it a different kind of way? We don't have to do it like that, can we? Why do we have to lay off so many people? These are my friends. Why do we have to cut them off? We can't do that. <laughs> Same scenario, isn't it? Sometimes, when I say sometimes, we are affected by the change that God will call us to make in such a drastic kind of way until we are not ready for it. We're not ready for it. And Jesus told that man, okay, if you're keeping all the old, keeping all the commandments, he said, well, go sell all you have and then come and follow me. You know what happened? He wasn't ready for it. The Bible said he walked away sorrowfully. Other words, I want to do it, but I won't. Because I've got all of this and I'm not going to part with all of this good stuff that I have. So, Second Peter 1 and 5 told us then, if we find ourselves like Peter and we're not prepared, y'all go to Second Peter 1 and 5. 
Say, add to your faith. In other words, what do I do to get prepared so that I won't watch it, watch it, watch me. Second Peter, y'all see it? Second Peter, one and five say, add to your faith what? Virtue. Add to your faith virtue. Otherwise, pureness. And what else? Virtue, knowledge. And knowledge. I'm going to add that to my faith now, because, you know, without faith, I can't please God. So, the baseline is faith, but then I need to add virtue to it. I need to add knowledge. I've got to keep on being in the Word and hearing the Word of God, hearing the Word in a, in a solid kind of way, so I can apply that Word to my life. And then what i got to add? Temperance. i got to add temperance. This word is going to help me to govern myself. Somebody say, it's going to help me with self-control. Anybody ever need self-control? Because listen, sometimes, somebody say sometimes. sometimes. Man, there are some people can rub your nerves so and get you all on, on frazzled until you lose your self-control. So he said, add to it self-control. Otherwise, even though I may want to, I hold myself. Might want to say the wrong thing. Y'all ever had people pulling in front of you in traffic? Yeah, hey, you trying to get somewhere, you've been waiting in line, and all of a sudden somebody comes from way behind you, and they see a little gap, they squeeze in. Anybody ever had that happen? And I know y'all be excited. Oh, it's okay. Praise the Lord. Yeah, right. You don't say no praise the Lord, nothing. You'd be probably about to say something else, man. You don't sit there in the traffic, and then by the time you get there, because they done pull in front of you, then the light changed. Now you got to wait another five minutes. <laughs> so he said, add to your faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control. Listen, tell you never, that's preparing me. That's preparing me, folks. As I take that word in and I'm asking God to help me. Listen, God will put me in situations. If I'm impatient. He's going to put me in a situation where I'm, it's going to work me and help me to grow my patience. Yes. <laughs> I heard a pastor talk about that one day. He said he married a wife, good wife. She was a good woman. But he said, you know, he was he was a timely person. I'm kind of like me, I guess. He was a very timely kind of person. But he said his wife, she would tell him, okay, I'm ready in a few minutes. And at first he says, a few minutes turn into 10, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. He's sitting in the car waiting. And he said it would just it would just wreak him and just bother him. Because he was timely and he was trying to get to church and do whatever he's gonna do. He's trying to do it on time. And he said, The Lord finally spoke to him, you know what? I'm trying to help you work on your patience, because you were very impatient. And she being in his life caused him to have to slow down. So he said, Now, when she said in ten minutes, he just kinda cut him in. <laughs> and he just go ahead and do something else and just kind of chill and do something else to keep from becoming agitated or aggravated he just learned, okay, she said 10 minutes okay, it's going to be 30 so he'll do something else, read the scripture or looking at the news or do something different so that he won't be rattled why? because God give him a good person in his life but this good person also is there to help teach him how to have patience. I tell people, and I'm going to insert this parenthetically, listen, God does not match you with, up with somebody that's just as sharp with, as you are on everything. Y'all hear me today. A lot of times people pray for God to give them the right person, give them the right person, and just because they got some deficits, all of a sudden, I'm ready to walk away because they got deficits. You got de deficits too. Whether you see them or they see them or not, all of us have some kind of deficit. And usually, God will find somebody, like when I was praying and asked God to send me a good wife. Listen, God knew that I, 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 he knew exactly what I needed. And I really believe, he looks at my little resume, because he made me knew all about me, right? And he knew better than I did what I needed in a good mate to walk this journey. And I got to that point where I just asked him, I said, I know, I'm not going to put no more criteria. All I want you to do, give me a good woman that will walk this journey of faith with me. And I'll treat her right. That's the only criteria. Got to that point where that was the only criteria. 
The only criteria. The only criteria. Because listen, I thought I knew what I wanted. I thought I wanted somebody with nice lipstick and nice makeup on and look all pretty every day with all that fancy stuff. But as I walked, I had to repent. And one day I ran and I was in the neighborhood and I saw this child. She come to quarters every day, all lifted up and all the stuff all made up. One day I just asked her, I said, wow, she said, that looks good on me. I said, how long did you put it on? Oh, it takes about an hour and something to get it. What? Then I asked the mother about, how long until you get that stuff off? Oh, it takes a good it takes long to get it off because I got to do this. I got to do it. I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. I repent. I don't want nobody to get all that stuff because I don't have time. <laughs> God give me a girlfriend, a wife that, listen, if she want to go out and, and do something on a special occasion, she may duck up a little bit. I can deal with that. But every Sunday morning, I'm going to have to wait out there for her to do this and do that. And child, I'll be bonkers. <laughs> I just thought I'd insert that parenthetically, but I'm, I'm almost done. Amen. But the bottom line is, we have to ask ourselves, am I prepared for what God is trying to do in my life? And when I first start walking with him, chances are I'm not. And I admit it myself. Some stuff that God wanted to do in my life and he was trying to get me to a certain point, I was not prepared and I'm not hearing that, Lord. One of those things was to preach. Y'all, I told y'all my story. I play my music. I sing and do all of that. And every time I turn, somebody said, he's going to be a preacher. Oh, he's the preacher. Oh, he's the preacher. And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm saying that to myself. No, I'm not. <laughs> but when God got me in that situation, and I thought things weren't going to work out too good, I repented and I said, yes, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I think that's where God wants all of us. He wanted Peter to get there. And I'll tell you about Peter later. He got there, but he wasn't there yet. So the second scripture I want you to look at, 2 Timothy 2 and 15, it says something like, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman, a work person that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Or a study. Somebody say Study. study. Make sure that's what it says. Because a lot of times, people think, I'm dead, I'm ready. I'm ready for the blessing, Lord. I'm ready for all of that, Lord. And God said, no, you're not. You're just like Peter. you got some things already done, but you're not ready for, this, for what's going to come. And God wants to prepare us so that when he opens up the door, when he gives us this thing, or bless us in this way, we will glorify him and not make a mockery of the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Oh, yeah. Last scripture I want you to look at. 7 Corinthians 4. This is the preparation. After we have been prepared, we can be willing to say what Peter, what Paul said in 7 Corinthians 5 through 12. He said, I'm, been, I'm persecuted. But I'm not forsaken. See, that's taking some growing to do before we get to that. I can accept persecution, but I know you haven't forsaken me. I'm, I'm cast down. People talk about me, say ugly things about me, but I don't, I don't let it destroy me. But Kayla, I don't let it destroy me. I've grown to that point, see. And he got some other things that he lists in there that shows us what that process looks like. And as we grow to that point, listen, even Peter was able to get to that point where he was able to accept Christ and his mission for what it was. Not for the, just the good stuff, but he was able to accept, accept the bad and the, the trouble and everything that came along with it. That's why Paul said, that I may know him. That's in there too, that I may what? Know him. Know him. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, that I may know him. And as I get to know him, my story like Peter, would, would, I won't have that same story that Peter had. I wouldn't be rebuking Jesus. I'd be saying, all right, Lord, not my will, 
that nine will be God. Amen? Amen. Y'all get something out of that? Amen. Does it make sense to you? Amen. And I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to, uh, I got some more stuff we're going to talk about. So listen, Christ revealed how prepared are you? Let me pray with you. So dear God, in the name of Jesus, we are grateful for the opportunity to share with your people. We thank you for your word. For you said your word will not return void, but it will accomplish all that you sent it out to do. I thank you, Father, for the opportunity to share the word and making it plain that your word said even a fool don't have a need to error. I pray, Father, as we walk out during this Lent season, that you will help us to continue to examine our hearts, to examine ourselves, and let us look at the revealed Christ and then pattern our life with his, measure our life with his, and see if we have met the patience requirement. If we have been living in faith, if we've been long able to endure long suffering and whatever that looks like, help us, God, to be able to look at our life. When you said in your word, if I would judge myself, I won't have to be judged. You said, because when I'm judged, I'm chasing of the Lord so that I won't be condemned with the world. We don't want to be condemned with the world. But we want to align our faith in agreement with you, Father, and your will, your perspective. And then we want to run this race with patience. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you for what Christ's dying and resurrection came to do for us. And may we ever embrace his truth. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. And uh, next week, join us again. We'll be back. Lord's good. Right, on Sunday next week. Amen. Amen. Let's give Pastor a hand for the word today. Amen. 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 We're talking about Pastor talking about Christ revealed, and uh, and and just another add on top of what he was saying. Another good question to ask yourself: How has Christ revealed Himself to you, and how is He revealing Himself to you on a regular basis? How is he revealing himself to you? What is he doing to show himself strong in your life? Amen? And it's funny, it's such a good message because just this week, Christ has been revealing something to me and put a mandate on something that I need to do, that I plan to do later on this week. But we have to understand and hear his voice and know his voice, just like Pastor said. Because he's trying to, to talk to us, trying to tell us stuff, to open up our mind, to open up our understanding. But if we're, yes. you know, if we're so distracted, how's God going to reveal himself to us? Yes. There's something I was thinking about. I'll say this as we get to the offering. You can start preparing right now. But those who are uh, watching us online, you can go to centerfaithchurch.com and uh, you can go and donate your tithes, your offerings there. But I was thinking about how we don't take time to truly meditate on mm -hmm. the word of God or hear what he's saying. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. We go to the gym. That pastor gave a good example. Go to the gym. I don't know if pastor does this. But I know sometimes I go to the gym and most people have on their headphones. Mm -hmm. They're listening to music as they're working out. Mm -hmm. So obviously the music is a distraction. So, you know, you're, you're, you're listening to the music, you're working out, you don't, you're not thinking about much else. Okay, got that. All right. Um, you go home and you're sitting on the couch and you're, you know, trying to relax and be quiet, but what do you end up doing? Turn the TV on, maybe. Right. Maybe turn the radio on. Maybe start scrolling on your phone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Once again, that's a distraction. That's not, so if all this distraction is going on, you're not thinking, you're not meditating, or you're not, you know, thinking about the word or what, or, or, or God's trying to speak to you. You can't hear him because you got all that distraction. You get ready to go to bed, all right? Go to bed. So instead of just laying down in silence and thinking, what do you do? You turn the TV on, all right? Turn some music on on your phone or, or, or Spotify or something like that. We spend a lot of our time distracted yeah. to where if, if God is trying to reveal himself to us, how's he going to get through to us? You steadily listen to your phone, listen to the music, and listen to this. All that's good in his time, but when do you spend time in just silence? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and just give God time to talk to you. God, what is it that you want to reveal to me? I'm going to sit here in silence and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to meditate on you and your word and I'm going to let you speak to me. But he's trying to speak to you over the radio, over the TV, over what you, the, the podcast you're looking at on your phone and over this and that. And now 
it's harder for him to reveal what he wants to reveal yeah, to you. Yeah. So another thing that I've started doing is I, I, I like to work out, like Pastor says, but but when I do my, my job, when I do my cardio, I try to do that without any music or without anything. I've got a nice little trail behind my house. I'll run that trail with no no noise, no sound. I just, if God, if there's anything he wants to tell me, this is a good time because I'm giving God time to reveal it to me because all the distractions are gone. Amen. So keep that in mind. Your pastor talked about Christ revealed. Let's make sure that we are making way for God to reveal himself to us. Amen? Amen. All right. I told you last time we're going in Malachi as we're getting with our offering, and I want to make sure that we all understand, you know, where tithe and offering come from. We did one verse, Malachi uh, 3 and 7, and I want to do one more verse as we get ready to get into our tithe and offering and do our financial faith confession. Um, uh, Malachi 3 and 7, we've talked about that already, even from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from mine ordinances, and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, said the Lord of hosts. But ye, shed, ye said, wherein shall we return? We talked about that, how we need to return back unto God so that he can return unto us. But one of the key verses is verse 8, it says, will a man rob God? Yeah. Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? And tithes and offerings. God says that we have robbed him. Okay? You take any time and go at night and, 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 and kick in somebody's door and try to rob them, what might happen to you? You'll probably not make it out that house, depending on whose house that is. And, and, and that, that's worst case scenario. You'll use that to have you probably end up going to jail. And that's just robbing a person. What happens when you rob Think about this. This is a very this is a very serious offense. I don't want to be on that list of people who are who are, who are robbing God on a regular basis. But he's saying that if you're not giving or paying your tithes and offering, you are robbing him. How is that? Everything that you have, God gave it to you. And he's telling you here, this is what I require of you. If you're not giving back what he requires, that is robbery. Because what you have belongs to him. Amen. It's his. And you decide to keep it and say, oh, I'm not going to give you the portion that you, the little portion that you asked. You could ask for all of it. That's all it is. But the little portion that you asked, you don't want to give that back to him. That is robbery. All right? If, if, if pastor gives me $100 and says, hey, this is still my $100, but I'm, I'm going to let you use this $100. But for this $100, I require 10%. I require $10. I, I take it. All right? Yeah. Thank you, pastor. I take it. Go. You know, agreeing to the Agreement, I go about my business and never give his ten dollars back. I just robbed him. Because I made an agreement and I didn't do my part. Okay? We do not want to be on that list of people who are robbing God. Okay? It says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed thee in tithes and offerings. Let's make sure that we're giving back unto God. Our offerings is our free will offerings. The thing good thing about an offering is God may lead you to give your offering to your church, but he may lead you to give an offering to another church, to another ministry that has been uh, relevant in your life. Okay? That's that offering. Your tithe goes to your main church, the church that's feeding you on a regular basis. That's where your tithe goes. But your offering can go to your main church or another church that's ministering to you or a church that you see growing that you want to help establish. Okay? Amen. Let's make sure that we are not robbing God. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's get ready to do our financial faith confession together. We are financial faith confession. If you need an envelope here, those in the sanctuary, please raise your hand. We will get that for you. Centerfaithchurch.com for our, um, minis our, our members that are online. Let's read our financial faith confession together. My Heavenly Father, I now purpose in my heart to offer my financial gifts willingly, cheerfully, and generously as an act of my obedience in support of your kingdom. Your word assures me in various passages in the Old and New Testament that your bountiful blessings shall be mine when I consistently walk by faith and obey your commands, which include my generous gifts. I anticipate your provisions of peace, joy, health, wealth, and wisdom as I consistently and cheerfully follow your plan for my life. I will leave your word, and I ask you to manifest yourself in my life as I am a doer of your word, and not just a hearer. In Jesus' name, amen. 